dear colleagues, the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation Brussels Office welcomes you to this lecture uh, uh, of Dr. Pedro Paez. Uh, Pedro Paez uh, was a Minister for Finances and Economy of Ecuador and uh, member of the UN Stiglitz Commission. And uh, we are cooperating since three years, since the opening of the Foundation's office here in Brussels. And since we are here uh, feeling this earth quakes and tremblings all the time about the crisis. So uh, we were working already uh, uh, on the analysis of the crisis and um, to give you a, a very short introduction on our point of view. We think that the uh, measures uh, the European Council is taking is no solution for this crisis because it's fastening in a way the, um, let's say, the uh, bubble economy of finances internationally and it's no solution in a way that it is stabilizing the European economy and the especially the situation of uh, development and growth within uh, the uh, member states. So uh, there's a lot to say about it from the inner view of uh, our European Union. But um, what is really uh, dangerous, uh, we think, is that the um, central promise of the European Union to its citizens, the promise of wealth, is partly destroyed by this uh, crisis. And another central uh, issue of the European Union, the development of a European democracy, is in danger too. So we think it's rather um, important to continue to work and to try to find alternatives. Alternatives in terms of political transparency and development for Europe. Alternatives in terms of solidarity between European, uh, uh, let's say, still wealthy and not so wealthy countries. But what we could say nevertheless is, this is not a homemade crisis. It's a crisis that is going far beyond. It's a world crisis. And so we enjoy very much to uh, have uh, Pedro Paez with us, who is working on the world crisis and financial and um, architecture since years, with his view from outside, which could help us to understand better and to develop alternatives. I'm very happy to introduce to you to Helmut Scholz, member of the European Parliament of the Left. And thank you very much that you are joining us. Perhaps you want to say some words to the audience too, Helmut? Uh, first, I have to excuse for coming late. But I came, of course, also to hear Pietro Paez, who is a old fellow of us, a colleague who is working very hard on alternative ideas concerning the world currency system. Um, and I guess that common good uh, is one of the issues where we have to find alternatives in a way that uh, this could uh, show us a way out of the crisis. Uh, and Maybe we have the chance to discuss certain issues on the fourth paper that's coming afterwards, so I will not take the time for, for this. But uh, I came just from Ecuador uh, the week before Easter, where we discussed uh, the challenges, uh, where we discussed the challenges and the task concerning uh, the further cooperation relationship between Ecuador as one of the 
uh, and uh, countries with the European Union and uh, the will of both sides to find a new approach for the composition of the trade and commercial relationship between uh, European Union and Ecuador in particular uh, and the contradictions which lay in the uh, uh, approach of the European Union side to uh, ask Ecuador to follow the already concluded Peruan and Colombian uh, free trade agreement, association agreement, um, and the will of the Ecuadorian side to say no, it should be not only a free trade agreement, but if there is an agreement, then this agreement must take into account common goods and um, the alternative development plan, so it should be an agreement about development and cooperation and uh, trade. So we, we discuss it and maybe that is also the part um, of, of our today's meeting to, to, to link the long-term perspective of creating alternatives uh, with the political challenges we have to uh, take into account by, uh, by establishing um, bilateral relations in the current times. So let's start. Uh, thank you, Helmut. We pass the floor to Pedro Paez. His lecture will take about 45 minutes and then we have the opportunity to discuss the central uh, points of uh, challenging uh, analysis and your proposals for alternatives. Thank you, Pedro. No, thank you very much uh, to the Rosa Luxemburg uh, Stiftung. Um, Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung has been one of the most uh, a, a devoted a fellows, a comrades in this effort that we had deployed from Ecuador a, since 2008, and more specifically, a Birgit Diver, a, trying to create the, the widest a, network of people from the most different perspectives, political, religious, and geographical origins, in order to build up a new type of uh, society, a new type of alternative to this uh, structural crisis that uh, we are living. Um, and one of the uh, key points of convergence has been precisely uh, the theme of this meeting common good. Common good and common goods in plural. And the role of money, the role of the new financial architecture that, that has been the, the perspective that we had uh, presented, we have been fighting for this uh, from Ecuador, that you know uh, is not uh, precisely the most, uh, the heaviest uh, 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 geopolitical uh, actor in Latin America, less so in the whole world and uh, do not have the, the resources to, to go through this type of, of proposals. But even though uh, we have been able to present this idea, this agenda, uh, in the middle of, uh, of a very harsh uh, intellectual and political environment in South America, now this is a reality, the new regional financial architecture, lab, Last week, uh, Banco del Sur, Bank of the South, uh, the new institution uh, called to be the key of the transformation of the developing banking has started its, uh, its operation. Uh, the new common currency in Latin America, Sucre, the, the unitarian system of, 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 uh, of uh, uh, compensation, regional compensation, has already uh, functioned for two years with a totally different perspective uh, than the Euro, with no neoliberal constraints, and uh, not putting the, the car before the, the horses. We are not trying to sacrifice all type of policies in the altar of the money. We are 
on the contrary, creating the conditions from this new artifact, from this new creation, from this new instance of supranational decision and supranational policy space, the money, the common currency, for the enhancement of other national capabilities. We don't have this dichotomy between supranational sovereignty and national sovereignty, more so. We are building up conditions, not only for supranational and national improvements, but also at the subnational and the popular uh, conditions for agency, for sovereignty. And finally, we had already started this alternative to the International Monetary Fund with a continental uh, financial safety net that could prevent the possibility of the same type of speculative attacks that uh, uh, such a strong economy like the European one has suffered during the last years. And you know what? Uh, this is not uh, all. Uh, the last uh, meeting of BRICS in, in India, March 29th, has already adopted the same type of horizon for the construction of a new type of South-South cooperation. We had, in the middle of these negotiations that we had with the, the European Union, uh, already in 2008, contacts with uh, President Barroso, discussing the new type of possibilities also of a new type of North-South relationships, not based in this predatory scope of the free trade agreement, that at the end of the day is going to kill the golden egg goose, but another type of win-win relationships that could open the doors precisely for another environment for common good and for common goods, including the possibility of a, 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 a multiplication of, of trade, a multiplication of job opportunities in both sides of, of the TL. Those are examples of a, a new perspective of uh, what finance and what money should be. Those are not coming, unfortunately, from the textbooks, the traditional, the conventional textbooks of the mainstream economics. Those come from the long-term tradition in, in economics, in philosophy, in sociology, that are not, uh, unfortunately, part of the day-to-day uh, -day, uh, training and uh, learning at the level of the universities. Um, we have uh, notions about uh, common good and common goods uh, since uh, St. Augustine and Aristotle in, 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 the, in, the, in the Western tradition. We have, in the case of other type of societies, like the indigenous peoples in Latin America, a long discussion about this type of issues, uh, this type of issues without naming it, without naming the notion of public good. Our societies for millions of years, in the process of, 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 of hominization, has been, has been working for the common good of the society, of the no-sphere. What appears now a huge problem, even in terms of the definition of what is good for the common, is a trouble because of the escission of the society, because of the conflicts in the society, because of the absurdity of the mechanisms of sociability. The problem is that the complex and rich uh, grid of human relationships that uh, eventually formalize themselves in terms of social relationships, most of them related to the realm of, of, of the sacred, most of them related to the realm of, of, of the myth, most, most of them related to the realm of the right, uh, most of them related to the realm of the fetish, of the religious fetish. With the, the passing of time, with the evolution of the same noosphere, that means the uh, intentional creative action 
of the human being in the society. This specific species that could transform permanently the, the niche, the ecological niche that could revolutionize all the time the homeostasis with the rest of the environment require some mechanisms of a, a recreation of the coherence between production and consumption. Some mechanisms of dynamic coherence in the relationship with the future. Some mechanisms of, of a, a, a preservation, of creative preservation in the middle of uncertainty of a societal project. And this is not automatic. You know, during thousands of years, in this process of humanization, in this process of human evolution, those type of mechanisms were related to a, a political and religious institutionality. Uh, sometimes uh, out of the basic mechanisms of reason. Part of the, modern, of the modernity, part, part of the capitalist modernity has been precisely the capability of introducing instrumental rationality in every realm of the society. But the key mechanisms of this transition has been the uh, transfers from this syntax of the religious fetish to the merchandise fetish and to the money fetish. And during the last few thousand years, and we have to be careful with these words, during the last few thousand years, human society has abandoned all other mechanisms of sociability, of recovering this coherence between production and consumption, between today and tomorrow, and to reduce all of those rich and complex uh, human relationships in terms of money. So now the filter of efficiency, the filter of rationality and reasonability that is accepted by the society has to pass precisely through the functioning of money and finance. And that is why uh, we decided to put an example of this situation in terms of the, what is happening now uh, with the unfolding of the structural crisis of capitalism, specifically here in, in Europe. But this has to be taken as a global problem. So now, all the possibilities of reaction uh, facing such uh, huge challenges as we are going to see a little bit uh, about uh, the environmental crisis, about the fact, the quantitative and qualitative fact that we are now 7 billion people, has to be resolved through the mechanisms that has been allowed by a system ruled by finance and money. That is the basic condition of sociability. So let me, let me go into the details uh, in order to present uh, basically provocations and to, to, to create the conditions for the debate in the last half an hour. First of all, this, what is happening now is not the complication of a financial crisis. What has been uh, uh, exploded or has been imploded during the last years are the remedies to the structural crisis that started 40 years ago. During the 60s, the boom, the, the, the golden years of capitalism, the most important rates of growth uh, since the beginning of, of, the, of the humanity, of the recorded statistics of the humanity, ended because uh, the, the uh, convergence of several uh, symptoms of, of uh, an extended crisis of overproduction. Overproduction in terms of merchandises, but also overproduction in terms of capital. And you have here uh, I, I, 
I couldn't have, uh, I couldn't uh, arrange uh, statistics for the uh, different sources here in Europe. There are methodological problems to do it. But you have here more or less the same type of graph of the uh, installed capacity in the United States. And you can see the important uh, change in the, in the level of uh, utilization of the industrial capacity in the United States in the middle in the framework of a reduction in the dynamics of physical investment there. This is directly related to the problems of income distribution that we are going to go into the details in the north, but that has been the norm during the last years as the solution to this crisis of overproduction. And that is crazy. That is one of the main uh, evidences of the incapacity of uh, the current organization of the society based on money and finance to resolve the crisis. We have a problem of overproduction and the basic response is to reduce markets through a process, generalized process of social polarization. You can see here the level of inequalities all around the world. This is within country inequality. So what you have in the north here is the, the concentration of the 1% uh, the richest uh, part of the population in the United States since uh, at the beginning of the last century. And you can see that the level of concentration of income uh, after the Reaganomics is more or less the same than the concentration of income that created the other structural crisis during the 30s. But this is not a unique problem. That has happened in all the countries in the world. And you have only during the last 30, during the last uh, decade, some uh, mitigation of that process. So let's go into the details. What is the reason for this absurdity? How come we can solve a, a problem of lack of markets, overproduction crisis, with a systematic process of market association? The key of the matter is that the, the motto, the engine of the movement of the society, the organization of the society, the organization of the solutions to the problems of the no sphere, come from the rate of profit. This is, this is the line, uh, the, the, this black uh, line shows you the statistical approximation to the rate of profit in the United States, Japan, uh, Germany, France, uh, United Kingdom and Italy. And you can see that since the 60s, uh, as part of this problem of overproduction, you have a relative compression in terms of the relative prices of the rate of profit that was only recovered after the application of the neoliberal policies uh, since the end of the 70s, the 80s. Huh? However, an important part of that uh, uh, recovery of the rate of profit, of the profitability in the North, do not came, did, not came, did not come out of the endogenous mechanisms. You can see here which was the uh, tremendous transfer of excedent, of surplus, from the South through different mechanisms, among them the external debt and all the connected uh, macroeconomic responses in the South through the austerity policies that change the terms of exchange of our products. I think it's very, very important for you here in the North to reflect on these type of issues because the structural crisis of capitalism has reached such a point in which the metropolis are not colonizing only the South now, but they are, they are colonizing now their own nation states with the same type of recipes that they applied before to us. So, let's see what happened here in the North. Let's concentrate a little bit what happened in terms of the endogenous policies here in the North. Uh, 
One of the, uh, we don't have time to, to show in the details the, 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 the process, but just two main factors of the uh, recovery of profitability in the North. Here, coming from the endogenous process in the North, you have a recovery of the rate of profit due to the compression of salaries in these uh, uh, white dots. And in this case, you have a reduction of the level of, of uh, I'm sorry, you have a, a, a stagnation of the level of, of wages, uh, opposite to what happened during the golden years of capitalism uh, in the post-war, but you have an increase in the rate of consumption. So how is this possible to compress revenues and to increase consumption? debt. The only way to do it is through debt. So there is no only moral issues or personal character uh, weaknesses that have created this problem of over -indebted. Those are endogenous structural needs of capitalism. Without this process of indebtedness, the recession should start here. If the level, of, if the rhythm, the evolution of consumption uh, should follow the, the evolution of, of the revenues, the level of GDP growth in the North would be very dim since the 70s. So indebtedness is not a moral uh, defect of the Greeks or the Spaniards or the Portuguese or the Italians. That is a need of capitalism. The other uh, 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 side of the coin is what happens with this recovery of the rate of profit that we reproduce here from the last, uh, the, the other, the previous graph. Yeah, that is a very important uh, 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 result for capital, for the reason, the motto of capital, profitability. But the problem is that capital is condemned to recreate itself, to reinvest without uh, any rest. This restless compulsory behavior of capital increasing itself, claiming each time higher and higher rates of profits, and each time in shorter and shorter periods of time has created also a dead end for the system. Because there is no enough opportunities for productive investment now. And you can compare that situation with, in this uh, uh, black dot uh, line, you can compare the evolution of productive physical investment. During the golden years, you have a correlation between the level of profitability and productive investment. Since the application of the neoliberal policies, you have this tremendous gap. So, where the money goes? What is the difference between profitability and investment, and productive investment? The irrational exuberance of Mr. Greenstone. Financial innovation. So it is not possible to return the genius to the bottle, as some people believe, only through re-regulation. Because we have a problem of over-accumulation of capital. And the whole future, the fate of humanity now, resides precisely here. We cannot decide as, as, a, as a society, and more so, we cannot decide this as a global society, as seven, mil, 7 billion human beings. We cannot decide what is good for the common, because everything passes through the filter of who controls power. And power is organized today through this type of mechanisms, residing upon the rate of profit. 
And this is the, 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 the very severe uh, situation that we, most of the time, refuse to accept. This is a problem of global denial. This is not a, fini a financial crisis. This is a crisis of civilization. We have several very urgent tasks to, to face. But we cannot do it because the problem of agency. Who is the historical subject that could take, could undertake this type of challenges? Right now, who decides in the society is who decides the rhythm and the orientation of capital accumulation based upon the rate of profit. Again, one of the main indicators of the conjuncture has to do with the level of income distribution. It's the same graph that I presented before. Here is the level of income of revenue concentration of the United States in white. And again, you uh, after the neoliberal policies, you have more or less this, the level that uh, produced the structural crisis of the 30. But you have here the case of Europe. The gray one. The gray one. And that is one of the reasons of the austerity policies. They need to catch up here in Europe. They need to provoke a very sharp income concentration in a very short period of time through austerity policies. The same type of policies, the same type of recipes that they provoke with the debt crisis in Latin America 30, 40 years ago. So the idea is to rapidly catch up with the level of social polarization that you have in the United States. There is no other rationality behind what is going on now in Europe. And again, we have to face very quickly a lot of challenges. But capital also has to face a lot of challenges because so far has been the, the success of capitalism has been based upon the accessibility to cheap fossil energy. And you have a problem of peak oil and big other type of uh, 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 sources of uh, cheap energy. Not because there is an immediate absolute end of this type of sources and resources, but because the new type of discoveries are more and more expensive. And if the problem is profitability, we have a huge challenge that has not been assumed, has not been faced over the mechanism that has been the, 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 the success uh, characteristic of capitalism during the last 500 years, innovation. The problem of overproduction has created a historical a block to the rationality of capitalism. During the last decades, has been, it has been more and more important the effort and the cost to prevent the diffusion of innovations in order to create a monopoly than the rhythm of introduction of those innovations. But let's be, let's be very clear about this. We are not talking about the stop of technological innovation. What we are saying is that the arsenal of innovations is so humongous and at the same time the commercial application, the commercial deployment of those uh, 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 innovations is each time more and more sparse. Capital has created a lot of mechanisms, among them intellectual property. The basic strategic offense offensive of the United States and Europe in the free trade agreements 
as not being related to goods and trade, but what is called in the terminology of the WTO, the World Trade Organization, the Singapore issues, including intellectual property. That is a fancy name to create monopolies and to prevent the diffusion of innovation. In the statistics of research and development of the United States that has been one of the main factors of the leadership of the United States during the last uh, century, last century, during the last decades, one third of research and development expenses in the United States is devoted to juridical suits, litigation. They had closed NASA, they had closed a lot of the uh, uh, leading programs in terms, of, uh, uh, in terms of science and technology, and they had devoted more and more resources to this type of mechanisms, preventing the diffusion of uh, these possibilities. And in the, in the case of energy, we have, well, in the case of uh, the continental Europe, specifically in the case of Germany, you have an important, uh, almost marginal, but important development in terms of new technologies. In the, ten, in, in the case of the United States, all the uh, uh, evolution, uh, all the, uh, 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 all the uh, flourishing of initiatives of alternative energy during the 60s and the 70s was bought up by the, grand, by, by the largest transnationals of oil and finance. We had lost 30 years of technological innovations to face this type of ecological challenges because the logic of blocking innovation, creation of monopoly and the alternative in terms of profitability, geopolitics and war. The conundrum of the Middle East, the conundrum of the geopolitical situation today is not related to communism versus capitalism. That was the alibi 40 years ago. Now it's very clear that everything has to do with oil. The humanitarian imperialism in, the term, in terms of Libya in terms of what is happening now in Syria, the, 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 the planification of the invasion of Syria and the military aggression in the aftermath of Iran, and maybe also in Latin America, has to do with raw materials and more specifically hydrocarbons. Oil, the hypocrisy of the humanitarian imperialism is just a disguise for oil and financial interest. And we have plenty of possibilities, of technological possibilities, based on the real free trade. We should talk about free trade in this type of realms in order to prevent war, in order to promote peace. But this is not in the agenda of the oligarchical and imperial powers. And we are in we are facing an immediate challenge in this situation, not because of the traditional vision of peak oil, but because in terms of the um, input-output energy measurement, in terms of the energy throughput, we have lost the advantage that created the basis for the rapid growth during the last century. You have in the 30s the relationship of the units of energy reduced to the same measure. The correspondence between the units of energy that you need, in this case in red, to produce one, the equivalent to one barrel of oil was this level. In the 70s that was deteriorating. Uh, smoothly, but the evolution of this during the last uh, decades, especially 
since the 90s have assumed a, an exponential negative trend. And that could mean that, that, could mean that today the amount of energy independently of the relative prices that could be manipulated be, uh, around the uh, geostrategical moves and the financial manipulations, this is inexorable. The relationship now is more or less in this area. And all the perspectives under the current technological paradigms that have been blocked during the last decades because of the logic and the dictatorship of profitability, of monopolic profitability, could present a very uh, sharp situation in terms of conflict and tension. The dispute, the geostrategical dispute, has a very sharp scenario of exacerbation. Okay. So we have this situation. Instead of the rhythm of technological innovation that has been the, 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 the triumphal card of capitalism during the last, the civilizatory triumph of, of capitalism during the last centuries, we have a very a, a, a fast accumulation of the trends in relative terms, not in absolute terms, in relative terms of this other type of uh, experience in terms of monopoly and in terms of geostrategic solutions. So the convergence of all these factors have created a new type of logic. You can see here uh, the statistics about in black about the uh, growth, the evolution of the real economy, global GDP. And since the application of the neoliberal policies, you have not only a very sharp reduction in the average rate of growth of GDP, but also much larger volatility. The IMF has uh, realized an inventory of the financial crisis during the, uh, since the application of the neoliberal policies. And they had count until before the crisis, until 2007, 267 financial crises compared with uh, something like uh, 27, 28 during the golden years of capitalism. So we are not talking about the black swan so typical of the mainstream economics. This is not a, a, a rare occurrence. 267 crises imply that financial crises are, are, are acting as a structurant factor of a relation of power. Those are a norm, a constant of this new way of existence of capitalism, the neoliberal capitalism, the globalized, financialized type of capitalism, 267 financial crises before this crisis. So this is very important, ah, and in comparison to this, you have in orange the growth of financial derivatives. And it is not a, 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 a coincidence that you cannot find exhaustive, reliable statistics about the real amount of financial derivatives in the world. So we have a change of epoch, a change of times, a change in the di a structural change in the dynamic of capitalism, from the real economy, from the productive capital to the speculative capital. The predominance of the logic of rent-seeking mechanisms and the hypertrophy of the speculative apparatus. Now, the global GDP, just to have a, 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 an approximated a, a, a idea of the, of, the, of the magnitude, the real GDP, the global level, is 60, 63 trillion dollars. The normal debt, that means public debt, 
enterprise debt and household debt in the world is $212 trillion. This is serious. It's almost uh, more than three times the size of the real economy. But the new debt, the financial derivatives, amount to, to almost $1,500 trillion. That means that with all the, the tricks, with all type of bailouts, explicit and implicit bailouts, with all the corruption of the regulatory agencies, with the complicity of the government, with all this type of mechanism of, of neo-colonization of the South and even here in the, in the same North, to extract surplus from the population in order to bail out permanently in a chronic way to, to, to the financial system, to, the, to the, the, the bankers that created this crisis. We should have to prevent the 7 billion human beings to eat during 25 years. And it is not possible to pay the debt. This is not an opinion. You can go bank by bank. JP Morgan Chase has $93 trillion in the balance sheet. Of course, of balance, because that is part of the paradox. That's part of the same type of absurdities that we are talking about. Bank of America, seven, $75 trillion. So each one of those banks had debts that amount for several times the global GDP. And the European banks had the same type of troubles. None of those debts has been taken into account, account in the official stress tests. None of those debts had been taken into account in the evaluation of the situation, both of the, of the financial and the non-financial enterprises. None of those debts had been taken into account in the real evaluation of the situation of the countries. Nothing of this is part of the evaluation of the rating agencies. And each time, these cycles that had occurred during the last uh, four or five years, had created a situation in which the emission, the issue of more titles, of more financial titles, have had less and less to do with fresh productive capital, what is called in, in financial terms initial public offerings. So that means that all the functioning of the financial indicators, the Dow Jones, the Nasdaq, the European indicators of, uh, of the city of London, of, uh, the Frankfurt uh, market, the France, the Paris uh, uh, bourse, it has nothing and nothing to do each time with the real economy, with the physical productive investment. We are creating all the signs, all the symptoms supposedly related to the recovery of the economy are basically feeding the monster, are increasing the size of this self-reference system of speculation. So let me show you how important is this, this proportion, this dislocation, not only in quantitative terms, this 63 versus uh, 1,500 uh, trillion dollars. No, it's also in qualitative terms. For example, just to illustrate the situation, and we can go into the quest with the questions into the details, but the global imbalances that are in some way a reflection of the problems and the disproportionalities of the real economy, no? show you this type of situations. Uh, you have a, 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 a chronic debt, a chronic deficit in the United States, and a recent deficit in Europe that uh, was supposed to be uh, financed by the savings of China and other uh, emerging economies. That was more or less the dominant discourse in terms of the conventional macroeconomics. Okay? Pay attention to this. This was supposed to be the source 
of the extent of, of the debt, of the public debt of the government, the United States, Japan, Western Europe, and other developing countries, and other, and other countries in the world. The problem is that those levels, that those unsustainable levels, have to be paid according to the picking order. Like what happened during the 80s with the debt crisis in Latin America. Or even previous to that, the destruction of the nation state control construction in the independent Africa. Look carefully this type of problems, because as Birgit said before, the crisis in the continental Europe is not an endogenous crisis. Europe is part of the structural crisis of capitalism since the 60s, but the specific financial crisis, the specific public debt crisis that has been created recently corresponds to this situation. In the aggregate, that is the level of indebtedness of Europe. Uh, source of the, or, or that is recreated and is exacerbated by this type of deficits. But in the reality, the relationship, the situation of continental Europe has nothing to do with the situation of, for example, United Kingdom or Japan and the United States. So, of course, Greece has a lot of problems. But the size of Greece is equivalent to the size of Alabama in the United States. And Alabama has been bankrupt during the last 15 years. And nobody has talked about the, the destruction of, of the United States and the, 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 the failure of the dollar on the, or, the, or, or, or the exit of Alabama from the Union. Spain, of course, had a lot of troubles. But think in relative terms. Spain had a much better fiscal performance than Germany until 2008. Three, four years ago, nobody could imagine that this crisis was going to engulf the whole European Union. Two years ago, that was a problem of Greece. Portugal, Ireland. Now it's Greece, Portugal, Ireland, Spain, Italy, and who knows if tomorrow that includes France, Belgium, and maybe Germany. Where are the main markets for the uh, success, the export uh, success of Germany? Here, and maybe China, but China is another, another issue that maybe we can address during the question. Okay, so look carefully to these last graphs. Those are the reasons from the real economy to the problem of debt. Those are the geopolitical aspects of the current discussion here in Europe. But this is what happened in the effective financial flows. So this is those are the financial flows in 1999, and the, the size of the arrows shows the, the, the direction and the magnitude of the, of, the, of the transactions, and you cannot see at all any important arrow from China and India to the United States. But you cannot see those either in 2007. The basic transactions, the basic flows of financial transactions are within the financial centers themselves, Wall Street, the city, Frankfurt, Paris, Hong Kong, Hong Kong, Tokyo, and among them, both in 2007 and 1999. There is no correspondence to the global imbalance that are the obsession of the macroeconomist, of the gurus of economy. That is what you are discussing in the European Parliament. That is the key of the, of, of the blaming game between the United States, China, uh, Germany, etc., etc., and the currency wars that are happening right now. 
Nothing of this is at the core of the actual functioning of the financial system. Nothing of this is at the core of the real dynamics of the noosphere, of the society. Human society has to face a lot of challenges, and none of those challenges are in the priorities of the real power. None of those challenges, none nor the common good, are part of the decisions or the priorities of the real powers. We can go into the details, we don't have too much time, about the importance of these new actors, the BRICS, the emerging economies, the new role of finance in general in the economy, and the multipolarity of this situation, but controlled by the so-called Anglo-American financial circuit. Not because the main banks are Anglo-American, but because this is a school of banking, different, for example, of the Renanian type of banking, to say something. But you have, for example, in the case of the United States, uh, 8,400 uh, 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 banks and only a handful of banks are part, of course the most important ones, are part of the so-called Anglo-American banking circuit. And you have, on the other hand, very important uh, financial institutions here in the continental Europe or in Japan or in Hong Kong uh, that are part of the, this network of financing whose uh, more important strategy of reproduction is related to financial speculation, to financial derivatives. Opposite to the other type of financial reproduction that came from a specific relationship between productive capital, including monopolic productive capital, and finance. The historical, the historical real concept of investment banking, not the Goldman Sachs, Goldman Sachs type of investment banking. Okay, so we can go into the details if you are interested. Uh, just to, to show you this, the result of this situation is the growing importance of financial profits in the GDP, in the North, in, the case, in this case the United States, with relationship to the GDP, the actual economy, and the other type of activities, profits. And to show how fast that has been reflected in terms of capital accumulation, capital concentration and centralization, power accumulation. Out of this database of 2007 of 37 million companies, legal information that you can access, we are not talking about the tax havens. The connections, this is a graph coming out of topology. You, there are some techniques in which you can organize the information in order to see the connections among corporations. 147 control out of 37 million, 100 and, uh, 147 control 40% of the GDP. I insist without taking into account the phantom enterprises, the triangulation in the Bahamas, in the Jersey Island, in the Cayman Islands, in uh, Gibraltar, in other type of tax heads. This is the explicit information. And here you have the 50 most important transnationals. You can detect here either the banks themse themselves, the same banks that out of corruption and incompetence created the crisis, or the main stock stockholders. And you can see here in one partial audit of the Central Bank of the United States, the Federal Reserve, that was published in July the last, last year, who was the beneficiary 
of the 16 trillion dollars bailout. And you can see the same financial institutions, not all of them American ones. The lender of last resort, contrary to any conventional textbook of economics, of macroeconomics, of finance, of banking, has nothing to do with the national institutions. <coughs> nothing of this is, strictly speaking, part of the national law of the United States. So every figure that was published before, every, every official figure, 0.7 of the TARP, Mr. Hank Paulson going to the, to the Senate of the United States, or, or 1.6 or 2.7 uh, trillion dollars has been the truth. The truth has been 16 trillion dollars, more than 100% of the GDP. And the University of Kansas City, Missouri, has completed this figure, no, the exhaustive figure, but this is just a partial fee. It's just one program, the Trouble Asset Relief Program. The amount of resources that has been poured into the banks um, has been collected up to $29 trillion. And the question is, what has been solved with all those resources? You know, $29 trillion is the equivalent to the annual income of 97% of the global population. That is the key of the discussion between money and public good, money and the good of the common. How are we going to solve these type of issues? We have presented, and this is the final a series of, of situations, that has in, around the notion of the new financial architecture. I mentioned this at the beginning. Now we are in the middle of a very sharp geostrategical dispute between the rent-seeking predominance of the future in the north, in the old, core of the system and the new industrial allocation in the emerging countries, including Russia and China. On one hand, there is, the, there is a possibility of solving the situation with international cooperation, the real free trade, the real free trade, not the free trade agreements, not the, the, free, the, group, the World Trade Organization philosophy, but the real free trade. And on the other hand, you have more speculation, more destabilization, war. We have, in the middle of this dilemma, a very sharp transformation of power. For archaic, the, 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 the return of capital to archaic forms of exploitation, the return of power to archaic forms of domination. This is happening very, very quickly. We have to create conditions to reassume power, to empower people at the level of the communities, at the level of the of the. Uh, sectional governments, at the level of the national governments, at the level of these new uh, horizons of integration, at the level of a multipolar world, in order to prevent the further concentration of power in this oligarchical and imperialist agenda, whose only horizon goes to more war, destabilization, dismantling of social conquest. We can prevent this degradation of civilization upon the basis of a lot of possibilities that you can find in the institutions that, for example, you already have here in Europe. In Latin America, we have created this new financial architecture as one of the premises for this empowerment of the new governments, of the new progressive policies. 
I'm sure that we can discuss, we can create the conditions at the level of the policy making, cir making circles, at the level of the universities, at the level of the intelli intelligence, in order to search for solutions. We are 7 billion human beings. We are 7 billion brains that we can think of solutions. Let's democratize the process and for sure we are going to find the solution. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. So the floor is open to discuss how do we get from the part to being a problem as Europe to being part of the solution. It's only a part of the solution, uh, but that could be, uh, we believe, I mean, a part of the solution. And by taking over I mean, the control of the, uh, I mean, that is for the, uh, the state situation, but also for the uh, uh, private, uh, be it, I mean, persons uh, borrowing for the, uh, buying an apartment or whatever, or corporations also, uh, the, the, the principle of having public banks who do not lend money for speculation, but would lend money for specific, socially, environmentally sound uh, uh, purposes. I mean, controlling these financial institutions would be a key to the I mean, development of the uh, new strategies, economical and social strategies. That is a part. Another part, I think, is important is to reduce, I mean, we have now a bubble, I mean, a, a financial and monetary, uh, a huge amount of money, of credit, which is balanced by uh, a, a huge amount, same amount of debt. You cannot have credit without the debt. So it's there now. So the other, the, the second then, besides taking control of the, uh, uh, the money, product, money production, also we must find a way to reduce these huge amounts, which are a social problem, I mean, and uh, this could be done through, that is, I mean, just an idea, but some, some economists, I mean, bring up these ideas uh, through uh, a process of, process of inflation, which would reduce the relative importance of the uh, monetary assets or taxation on wealth, etc. So we have to find ways to reduce the importance of these things, okay? Then this I am this. Would like to have your opinions on these two aspects. Immediately? Okay. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, most of the debate so far, eh, including in the progressive and heterodox uh, circles, including attack, for example, but also including uh, academic circles uh, uh, far away from the orthodoxia, uh, have been prisoner of a myth. How come it is technically responsible and theoretically sound to pour trillions of dollars, trillions of euros in the same speculative circles that created the crisis out of corruption, out of incompetence, creating this speculative bubbles, creating this speculative hypertrophy. And how come it's totally irresponsible and populist and, 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 and uh, uh, totally ignorant to propose resources for full employment policies 
for the development of science, technology, for environmentally friendly projects, for conviviability projects, including the possibility of a, a, the integration of minorities, the, the promotion of, of uh, new members of the society, etc., etc. Where is the theory behind this? Who says that if the government produces a new project for the good of the community, for the common good, this is inflationary, but it's not inflationary to inject $29 trillion in the same banks that created the crisis. More so, was supposed to be, and the economists had this as, as kind of the law of God, that if you increase the monetary aggregates, you had an immediate relationship in terms of inflation. So we more than doubled the amount of the monetary mass during the last years. And where is the inflation? Where is the inflation? It was supposed to be one to one. Where are these 29 trillion dollars of liquidity injection in the United States in terms of inflation? Where are the bailouts here in Europe in terms of inflation? And nobody says anything about this in the economics profession. There is nothing about, nothing about this in the text of macroeconomics. Who talks about this in the, in the programs of, fin of finance and economic debates in the television or in the press? Nobody. So we need to start changing our subjective perspective. We have plenty of possibilities here in Europe, just for example, without changing the constitutional framework of the European Union. There are plenty of possibilities without changing even the current mandate of the European Central Bank. There are possibilities to finance projects for the government. And without changing the legislation, there is possibility, there are plenty of possibilities to work in alternative uh, mechanisms of financing at the national governments, but also at the sectional governments. It has been done already. You know, we, are, we don't have time to go into the details. Greece, Ireland had issued currency without the knowledge of the, of the population, not necessarily for the good purposes. Uh, Napoli had created a local currency and now everything is possible to do with the discipline of the electronic system of payments. We have done this in Ecuador, we have done this in Latin America. The banks are creating money all the time. 97% of the monetary aggregates are issued by the banks privately not by the central banks and an important fraction of the central banks are not state-owned are not national banks are private <coughs> banks are private corporations so everything that we have in our heads about what is going on in terms of money and finance has been distorted we have to study we have to discuss openly without taboos without a priori requalifications. The solution for Europe is here, right now. We are, you are not condemned to follow the same path to destruction that we had in Latin America. to uh, um, deprivatize, at least partly, the, the banking system, 
to go to public and into the what attack is proposing uh, on um, uh, public banking and I think uh, it's necessary uh, what you said uh, I think this is a, a, an ongoing debate on the so-called euro bonds that states don't have to loan money from private banking there are some measures I think that are already even also in the European Parliament in, in the debate but what I see as one of our problems is that the governments are going uh, in another direction um, and uh, the governments with the fiscal um, my impression is simply that they are um, in, in a kind of panic and selling out uh, the still wealthy European citizens uh, goods so uh, perhaps Helmut you can say something about the debates in the European Parliament and, and um, but what is very clear from, from your um, explanations I think that we have to connect our debates and our uh, um, seeking for alternatives with the international uh, um, with the international uh, debates and not only to look on our small Europe because it's only one let's say one region within all these kind of circuits but what I find really the the, the what is what is really fear bringing me in, in, in a situation uh, of, of fear that is that every step uh, our governments are making to uh, uh, with the bailouts of the banks, with the um, contributions they are giving to Greece, with this, it's all going to the banking systems, to the banks, to the private banks, and all this money is going into this speculative circle that is destructing the productive uh, um, sources of. of all of us. It's destructing even the productive uh, parts of the capital uh, of the all. I remember when when we are part of the um, Finance Watch network that was created here on the, on the European level. And in, fin in the Finance Watch network there are many, many organizations from small and middle uh, sized enterprises, from public um, uh, services organizations and so on. It's not only public banks and so on, but it's all these who, um, who don't have any more a, a space to move to, 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 um, a, to develop that is under this threat of this kind of, of uh, politics. So perhaps, uh, Helmut, you could give something about the critical position in, in the European Parliament that is at least, uh, or could be at least uh, a more rational uh, institution to develop. And then if you have questions, please feel free uh, or comments on <coughs> Yes. First of all, I would thank to Pedro for this input. Maybe you want to speak first. I, I will not speak about the discussions in the European Parliament because I think there are more important questions you just have uh, raised in your uh, uh, introductory uh, contribution to this discussion, to this uh, debate we have here. But what I want to say is, you have said we cannot decide as society what and you have asked what is it the European Parliament is discussing. So that leads us to the question, who are the actors? Who, who are the subjects of deciding on all these issues? And that leads me to one, one problem that um, even have, uh, have heard a lot of debates in Ecuador concerning the, the Suez regional um, uh, integration, the role of the Sucre, etc., etc., uh, in a dollarized country or a country which is dollarized uh, currency. So that means um, if you are speaking about subjects, who is deciding? Then the European Parliament concerning the challenges uh, Pedro just raised. The European Parliament is a, the smallest uh, uh, contributor because all the questions of the financial markets are not in the competence of the European Parliament. 
yes, in the European Union. And, and if I fully agree with, with, the, with, the, with the demand of Pedro Paez when he's demanding let's democratize uh, the, the, the issue, because then we have to find out why we have established a fiscal pact, avoiding the real European Union instructions and institutional competences. Why we are going into, uh, into a controlling a process where the where the public is excluded from. So I mean that is that I think is a real task for the moment that we have first to inform, secondly to discuss, thirdly to call uh, persons to come back into the decision making process at all levels at the <coughs> municipal level, if you are speaking about the uh, public banking sector, about uh, in Germany the Sparkasse, etc. So, so uh, what does it mean at the, at the regional level, at the national level, at the European level? And uh, probably also we have to find a new approach at the global level. Because I don't think that we have to, to question if the genius uh, should come back to the bottle, then the question is what is the bottle? Uh, so, and with genius, so then we, uh, we are coming back to your introductory remarks, what is the role of money in, 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 in today's composition of society. So, uh, so let us better speak about the global redistribution of the wealth, of the, of the ways of financing the, uh, the, 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 the composition of the societies. The, I mean, that is a, the, is a real challenge, and then it is a, is a multipolar uh, task uh, beyond the finances themselves. It is a question of the media, so who is informing about all what we are discussing today, or what we have heard? Who is, is writing about that? Is it much too complicated for any citizens even, even to, to, to pick up this question? Because it seems so complicated that they are already stopping to, to interfere. <coughs> so we are leaving this fear uh, to the specialists. Uh, you have demanded the issue of the distribution of labor. Yes, I, I think we have to re, re, even to re-question ourselves what means distribution of labor in a globalized economy on equal footing. Um, so that sh short, shortly some, some comments on that. Uh, uh, there would be a lot of questions. I think if we are going deeper into detail where we have to, to discuss it, um, for the European Parliament, I would say we have to organize a real stepping in two concrete, uh, 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 opening a, a new entrance in the decision making on, on uh, the financial uh, aspects. And, and therefore, we have to defend, I would say, the European level, the European Union as a structure, with all criticisms concerning the concrete policies carried out by the different institutions of the European Union. But to, to, uh, to, to say, yes, the European Union gives us certain institutional and uh, social structure where we are able to interfere into this very complex uh, challenge. Uh, very quick, uh, very quick reaction. Is the, uh, I think it's key to realize how uh, deep we have embedded in our heads this type of situations that creates uh, this cornering in terms of in, in, in impotence. If the only people that could uh, have an opinion of these complex matters are the specialists, and the specialists are the bankers, could you guess what is the answer that they are going to give us? So precisely, you know, these type of issues we had discussed with grassroots organizations in Latin America with trade unions, with peasants, with indigenous communities in Latin America. So it takes some, some time, it takes some time, like the patients that you so generously had uh, shown this, uh, this uh, afternoon, but it's nothing like uh, rocket science, nothing like rocket science. I, there are much of a cover-up on behalf of the conventional wisdom about money and finance. There is an artificial complication of, 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 of the affairs. This comes 
what I am presenting here comes from the learning of your experience until 1992. I'm not talking about nothing new. It's what Roosevelt, Kennedy, Johnson, even Nixon did in the United States following the steps of Hamilton and Lincoln. And here in Europe, what? Okay, okay from Turgot and, Fre and uh, Frederick List in, in Germany, the theorized in, in, uh, in previous centuries, but is the experience of the European construction, the whole period of the post Second World War. So you have plenty of institutions to do it here and now without changing anything. And of course, you have to change a lot of things, but you have plenty of possibilities now. Now, I would like to give the floor to you, and then you want to take it. Willem von Hassel's Foreign Affairs, The Hague. What you just said, um, yes, I understand what you tell us in Europe, but the, why do we have the monetary union we have now? It is a German monetary union on, let's say, built on the trauma of Weimar inflation. It is a sort of clone of Bundesbank, for good reasons, for good reasons. Only one target, inflation. Um, uh, for, stability. Yeah, stability. To change the core, the constitutional political core of the European Union, monetary union, I'm sorry for the European Parliament. You don't have to be there. You have to be in Germany. The German Parliament in Karlsruhe. Germany is the decisive factor here. So I would like to hear something about the chances to, cha to change the debate there. And there's another sort of dilemma. Germany is not the heartland of the Anglo-Saxon financial culture. So, I mean, it's easy to talk about Europe and its institutions. But if you bring it back in high politics, and this is not blaming Germany, what I say. No, we have to blame ourselves. We didn't, Helmut Kohl said, no kind of Währungsunion on a politician. No one, none of us, nor himself, did define the minimal conditions what political union should have to be. And again, I'm afraid this is not decided in the European. So, what about Germany? <coughs> a, rapid a rapid reaction telegraphically. Uh, uh, Deutsche Bank, Societe Generale, uh, they are part of the Anglo-American circuit, not yeah. from the European continental circuit. That, uh, just to clarify things, in the case of Weimar, is plenty of myths. There is no issuing of money as the cause of hyperinflation. It was the external sector restriction based upon the uh, reparations of war. Remember the occupation of the rule. And more so, the German central bank at that moment was private. It was private. There was, there was all the blame upon the government is an ideological dichotomy, an sterile dichotomy. Nothing to do with this. It was, the, it was an accommodation of the monetary aggregates to the external sector crisis provoked by the occupation of the rule and the uh, reparations of war. That created the uh, uh, hyperinflation in, in Weimar. This is totally different. And in the case of Ecuador, precisely because we have more or less, they provoke, in Latin America, they had provoked the same type of crisis. And they provoke hyperinflations based upon this type of situations with very specific political motivations. Uh, the Cruzado plan in Brazil, the Austral plan in Argentina, the, uh, the first Alan Garcia in Peru, and in the case of Ecuador, the main purpose was to create this laboratory of dollarization, to the mutilation of national sovereignty in terms of currency. So even in the case of Ecuador, with all the political restrictions, because if we attempt to get out of dollarization, all the opposition and all the international, the international community uh, uh, probably would, would uh, launch a campaign saying this uh, re 
responsibility, populism, etc., etc. So we invent possibilities. There, where we didn't have monetary policy, we invented a liquidity policy. There, where we didn't have the possibility of managing, of, of managing the uh, nominal exchange rate, we invented a policy of real exchange rate. There, where the free trade agreements and the WTO uh, uh, commitments had impossibilitated any, possi any condition for trade policy, we created a new type of import, uh, industrialization by import substitution, a selective one, a reduced one, but we can create options. Could you imagine the spectrum, the repertoire of possibilities that you have here in Europe? Please. Okay, but I would come back. Uh, Europe is not, you mentioned Europe is not a, let's only Europe. It's the single states with very different approaches. And I think what went wrong with the initial um, creation of the monetary union in, in, in the Maastricht Treaty was that um, not only Helmut Kohl, but the others too, didn't trust in the political process of Europe. So they created a monetary union without trust in a common financial policy. Not to talk about the, the, the uh, uh, empty uh, uh, bottle of, of political union that was created then. And I think today, uh, this kind of um, destruction of um, a common uh, underst shared understanding between us Europeans by this crisis, that the ones are they that can save themselves and the others are the uh, lazy and so on and so on. Um, there is a duty to do. To work, to, to work against this kind of new destruction of a shared understanding what should be done on the political level. And that we have to do uh, pro probably in our own homelands. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Feiler, Global Fair uh, Organization. Uh, I have a I had also a discussion, as a lay, I'm a layman also, so macroeconomics questions, and as most of us, and we don't really hear, uh, and you hear also numbers and, and figures, but in between, and I have also the impression, here in the, in the Brussels discussion, but also from elsewhere other information, that currently no one has a solution. Even the biggest players, they don't know how to get back the genius in the bottle, how you said. Huh? So it's something out of the bottle, and I think the way, a lot of, to maybe come up several proposals like you explained from from South, from, from South America, but uh, I think the main point I see in between is more a change of value. The people, uh, what I also see man, even yesterday evening I saw in a television uh, a discussion on the giving pledge where the millionaires began to discover money isn't isn't everything. They have to give it away again. And there's a change of value. So to see that uh, that is what. For me, also the question is the policy. We have to find a way. You talk here about common good, so common good, to come back to the common good. That not profit is everything. That interest is everything. We have to come back. Common good is everything. And that is again that comes to get back to the policy. And once you have decided you want to have other values, it's easy to find the solutions. And you can just say, let's ignore the genius out of the bottle. We build our macroeconomy on new, on new values. Mm -hmm. It was, now my question to you, because that's in every country again a little bit different. That's, that's a, you have made it with the grassroots organizations. What do you think? How it can build here in uh, in Europe? Because here it's, it's a little bit different. We have a grassroots, you have a tech or some others, but it's not. Uh, we have the parliament in the different countries. So. No, every country in every <coughs> historical experience is, uh, is different and of course I'm very respectful about what is going on here in Europe. But I'm, I'm just, I'm really, really worried because uh, if uh, what uh, I have said so far is not uh, outrageous enough, uh, let me shake uh, you a little bit more. The rhythm 
of a substitution in terms of the strategies of reproduction of the elites here in Europe, uh, preferring the speculative strategy rather than the productive strategy, is creating an immediate danger of immediate conf of, of nuclear conflagration. It could be that the origin of this could be Iran, but it could be any other possibility. We are in the middle of a historical dispute for hegemony of the same type of, of the 100-year war. This is not solved with the invasion of Libya or the invasion of Ecuador or the invasion of Venezuela. That could be part of the dispute. But the real dispute is here in the north. You know, it's here in the north. The real alternative to the, the whole mechanism based upon the monopoly, the international monopoly uh, of the dollar are the, and the Anglo-American, between quotes, uh, circuit of finance was the euro, the neoliberal euro. <coughs> The reality is not black and white. It's plenty of contradictions, plenty of, of uh, nuances uh, that are playing the game in the middle of the most important uh, uh, contradictions of the, uh, of the moment that are related to this hegemonic dispute. You are, you are looking for answers. You gave them. You already gave them. You said, I'm a layman. You have an advantage. The economists, we are trained not to see things. You have the advantage of not being brainwashed during your professional training. This is a huge advantage. Feel free to express your opinions. Discuss them. You, you are going to have this type of alternatives. It's, it's, it's crucial. This type of opportunities that the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung has created are, of course, very important. But we have to open the most pluralistic and the uh, 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 pre prejudiced uh, uh, environment for discussing this. And the solution is what you said. Let's put first the priorities of life, the priorities of the society, the common good priorities. And let's find the mechanisms that could make these uh, uh, objectives possible. Right now is the opposite. We have the instrument, the financial system, the instrument, the money, the currency. And we subordinate everything, the life on the planet, to the priorities and the targets of who controls money and finance. We have plenty of options. This, and with this I'm finishing, this graph shows you the magnitude of the problem. The world as we know it is over. I know that it's hard to believe. You know, with the overvaluation of the financial assets, you have a, an illusion. Even in terms of the GDP, even in terms of the financial indicators, even in terms of the income generating mechanisms. If you put the balance sheets in terms of the real value of the assets, you have, let, let's put apart the financial derivatives, just with the level of the normal debt that I presented in the previous graph. The difference has been estimated in the uh, uh, light blue, and the possible correction of the balance sheet is the dark blue. But if you put this in sincere terms, including the financial derivatives, that is a collapse. More so, the basic mechanisms of the functioning of the markets have been destroyed now. Remember, for the people that uh, have in mind the, the basics of economics, the supply and demand. The idea is that the, the higher the price, more supply and less demand. There are more attractive, more incentives for the producer and less incentives for the consumer. But now, those 
trillions of dollars, trillions of euros that have been poured in the centers of control of the society, do not create it with this productive investment or productive credit or jobs. Where is this money going? To speculation. Where? If you don't have possibilities of creating new realms of real economy, that goes to speculation in the financial markets, spe speculation in other real estate bubbles, speculation in food, speculation in energy, speculation in carry trade, the exchange rate among uh, currencies. So the problem is that right now those prices have been totally distorted and there is no way to mapping up those resources. You go, this 29 or maybe more so, these trillions of dollars and euros goes from one market to the other, but they cannot enter into the physical economy. And that has created another condition. Now, as oil is not only good, but it's also a financial asset, if the price of oil goes up, the supply of oil is reduced. Because if I can sell oil today at 105 the barrel, maybe tomorrow I can sell to 120. And the demand of oil has been also distorted because it do not operate as a good, as a, as a merchandise. It operates as a financial asset. If today is, 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 is worth 105 the barrel of oil, I have to buy today in order to hurt the, the, the oil because tomorrow is going to cost much more. So everything has changed. The same is happening in terms of wheat, in terms of corn, in terms of, in terms of, 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 of seeds, in terms of uh, precious metals, in terms of copper, is everywhere. So you don't have the current mechanisms of decision are totally distorted. The only way to solve things is what you mentioned. Let's define which are the priorities of the society and let's decide which is the most efficient mechanisms, mechanism to make it viable. Thank you very much. I think, uh, if I'm well informed, we have uh, some sandwiches outside, so uh, you may discuss it, uh, the subjects with Pedro uh, taking a good sandwich and something to drink. Thank you very much for joining us, and let's uh, go on.